chapstick within like arm's reach. Oh. Yeah, so, I sort of figured that out. <laughs> it's like, oh my god, how much chapstick do you guys go through a year? <laughs> and do you ever get to the bottom before you lose it? My husband is the only person I know who's ever worn out a chapstick before. <laughs> I think that's a notable achievement. <laughs> I'm excited to be here and to be with uh, some old friends from the Academy and the workshop events uh, that the Higher Learning Commission sponsors, uh, as well as, I hope, some new friends as well. Back uh, two years ago, well, it's actually about three years ago, we used to, use, we used to do our winter workshops in Chicago uh, in February, and then we realized that's a bad idea. Uh, not really, people not want to really come to Chicago in February, excuse me, uh, but also we have a hard time getting them there and back because the weather inevitably. I uh, would screw things up, so then we thought, we're looking at the map of the North Central region, we're saying, <laughs> Arizona. Um, and so we've been here for the last couple of years, uh, and it's been great. Um, to, when we, we, we feel like uh, we've really seen a lot of the Arizona schools and some from New Mexico as well, uh, and I think we're starting to really get some traction on assessment after years and years of trying. Uh, to give you a sense of where we've been, okay, let's take a look at this. This was from 1997. Okay, 20 years ago, AAHE, the now defunct American Association of Higher Education, uh, put together the good practice and assessment, the seven principles of good practice and assessment. Uh, this is their list. Uh, and it's interesting that this list really has held up the test of time pretty effectively. We're going to talk about these again. Oops, just dropped it. We're going to talk about these again uh, and revisit them thinking about now 20 years later, what is good practice and assessment? Because quite honestly, we've evolved a little bit uh, and they've developed, on the other hand, we've developed some pretty bad practices as well. Uh, so we're going to talk about these uh, over the next hour. Um, Matt did finish a little bit early. I will not allow this presentation to become gaseous, expanding to fit the perceived space available. Uh, <laughs> so what I will do, I, I, I will do my talk, uh, and then we'll have time for questions and answers before the break at 10.30, okay? Because otherwise I could talk all day if you wanted, but there's too many other good things on the program. <laughs> So let's talk about best practice in student learning assessment. For my money, one of the most important things is to understand why you're doing assessment in the first place. And I think this has gotten lost thanks to accreditation uh, and other forces that are asking you for the information. So let's think about it in terms of assessment of learning. This is probably the type of assessment that most people are familiar with, especially as accreditation rolls around both regional accreditation and many of you are involved in professional accreditation as well for your field. Assessment of learning uh, evaluates student learning achievement in general education, your program level learning outcomes, is essentially an institution-wide function that's focused in on reporting, generating the data that proves to somebody that our students have learned. Okay, perfectly valid. Okay, but there are other functions of assessment as well, and I'm not sure we're thinking about these as often. The next one is assessment for learning. Okay, it's amazing how just changing one letter and moving them around will make a huge difference. Assessment for learning is when we're discovering how well students are learning and how learning might be improved. And this is something that faculty do all the time, but it's hard to get them to commit to the A word, okay, because this is just sort of a matter of course. This is really a, a faculty function and it's focused in on improvement. Okay, how can we do better this time? You know, you, you teach a class and you leave and you're thinking, ah, oh, geez, that so did not work. I will never do that again. Uh, and so you go back and you fix it so you know that you're not going to have that same experience of 50 minutes in front of the class where they're just not getting it. So that's assessment for learning. The third type of assessment is one that we talk about very, very infrequently, and that's assessment as learning. And this is a student function because assessment can help students become more aware of whether or not, for instance, their study skills are working, whether or not this is a field that's really going to work for them, whether they belong, okay, in a healthcare field that they can't get through AMP 100, anatomy and physiology 100. So this is what the, the function that assessment provides feedback to students on their performance that may prompt them to reevaluate their strategies towards learning and also perhaps their goals. Through assessment, they may realize that they're really good at something they had never considered that they were really good at before. But they get positive feedback on it that they're learning, and they may open, it may open up some really huge opportunities for students that they never ever considered, especially if you're dealing with first-generation students. 
okay, who come with a fairly narrow goal, and they really don't know what they're good at, because nobody's really encouraged them or shown them what they're good at. So assessment has this third function, okay, that we also need to consider. So thinking about assessment in terms of what are we really doing it for, we know that going back, we know that we have to do assessment of learning, because this is the reporting function, okay? Convincing faculty in terms of assessment for learning, and showing students how assessment is part of their ongoing learning process, then we're really onto something there. Assessment understands what needs to be assessed. Okay, so uh, when we first started doing assessment, I'll show you a slide on this, we were assessing all kinds of stuff. Okay, we really need to zero in on what we really need to assess, and we need to think about this in terms of degrees. So if we're looking at the number of credits, for an AA or AS, generally there's 40, 45 credits in Gen Ed, and then there's some extra credits in there, maybe 15 or 20 credits, which may or may not form a program. Okay, chances are those programs are not transcripted. They're a collection of courses, but not a program per se, though sometimes they are. So you've got to be careful about that one. If you've got an AAT degree or another sort of professional degree, generally it's about, 50 or, um, about half the credits, 30 credits gen ed, 30 credits of a program. An AAS, small gen ed, about 15 credits maybe of gen ed, and the rest are program or a BA or a BS, usually about 45 credits again with Gen Ed and the rest of the program, a major and a minor. So when we think about it, really our obligations uh, are the clearest for the AAAS and the BABS, because we're looking at Gen Ed, okay, exclusively in the AAAS, and for the BABS, we're looking at Gen Ed as part of it, but for the other degrees, we need to also have program outcomes and understand Okay, what students should be able to do as a result of studying their program. So we've got two different avenues, not only Gen Ed, okay, but also the program. What's interesting, especially about those two middle degrees, when you've got a smaller Gen Ed, maybe 15 to 30 credits of Gen Ed, is how those Gen Ed uh, outcomes translate into the field, into the program. So we know that uh, students are going to be able to communicate because that's part of the Gen Ed, but in a radiography program, what does it mean to communicate with a patient or a, a doctor, another member of the healthcare team? Okay, so thinking about in terms of how it translates into and moves up into the program. So understanding what exactly we're assessing is really critical. As is measuring what we value, this is one of the original uh, on the list from AAAG. We've got to be thinking about what we're going to spend our effort measuring. Ask yourself what's important to you as a faculty member, okay, in your classes, what's important to you as a program. What are the things you want your students to be able to leave here, being able to take with them into their career or over to their transfer institution? Okay, what's important? Do the, focus on the most important things. What's the most important things to, your, to you as an institution? A lot of institutions now are developing institution-wide outcomes, which is basically saying, this is what's important to us. Okay, we want you to be responsible citizens. We want you uh, to be able to uh, embrace, respect, uh, and interact okay, with diverse populations. We want, so these are the kinds of things that the institution finds important. Okay? These are the core values that you need to be thinking about. What are the most important things? Measure those things. Think about it this way. You've got values, what you think are important, and measures. And the question I want you to ask yourself seriously in terms of what you're doing now, are you valuing what you measure? Okay, so you've got measures, you're valuing those. Or are you, on the other hand, measuring what you value? Because we're seeing as more and more tools come up that measure stuff. I think the best example is the um, uh, surveys of student engagement, Nessie and SESI. Because now it's easy to measure, all of a sudden we're valuing <coughs> Nessie and Sessie. Okay, we're valuing those measures as opposed to whether or not this was critical to us and before then. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked at Nessie and Sessie for a couple of years, but one of the items that used to drive schools crazy was a, a question about how many 15-page papers the students wrote. I think it was 20-page papers, 15-page papers. Okay, because that was a measure of academic rigor. So all of a sudden, okay, schools would get their Nessie or Sessie results back and saw that they were not as high as their peers in writing big, long papers. So all of a sudden, students all over the place had to write big, long papers. So the school would do better on Nessie or Sessie. It's like, really? Okay. 
Is that really what's important for every school student leaving an institution that they write a 20 page paper? Maybe in some fields, yeah. But in a lot of other fields, that is so not the kind of writing they will ever do again. So thinking about it in terms of are we measuring what we value or valuing what we measure? Focus in on what's important to you, measure that. Okay, but don't get lured down the rabbit hole of finding something that's easy to measure and paying a lot of attention to something that's not really part of your culture. The basic rule of thumb is very simple. If you don't care about the outcome, you're not going to care about the data either. Okay, so focus on what's really important. A lot of faculty or a lot of schools report having trouble getting faculty engaged in assessments because you're not measuring the right stuff. Measure what they care about, then they'll get engaged. Best practice I mentioned, I was highlighting this a minute ago, best practice on assessment is focused and intentional. Let's go back, okay? Way back in 1988, I think, was the first time uh, Higher Learning Commission started talking about assessment. Okay, by 1992, they were starting to cook up some plans for all the institutions in the HLC region. By 1995, the day that we live in infamy, uh, they required every single school in the Higher Learning Commission region to submit their institutional assessment plan. Okay, June 30th, okay? So we were all scrambling to write our assessment plans. Uh, and then we had to turn them in, and then some committee of unknowns provided feedback to the schools. on assessment. This is back in 1995, okay? About 2000, 2001, 2002, okay, schools were assessing like crazy. Okay, and it sort of looked like this. Okay, everybody was measuring everything. So you'd be on a site visit for the HLC, and you'd get these piles of data. Okay, numbers on everything, okay? Two things, we couldn't make head or tails out of it because it made no sense. Uh, and secondly, the school never wanted to do assessment again because <laughs> they did it and it didn't prove anything. Okay, so intention without, it, or exertion without any kind of intention leads to exhaustion and it kind of honks off a lot of people. Okay, and you can only honk off people once on assessment because they remember this. Institutions have very long memories. When I was uh, on Long Ridge, when I was the chair of Long Ridge Planning on our campus, I would go into Faculty Senate with a great idea, and they'd listen and they'd smile and they'd nod and they'd do all those appropriate things. Uh, and then they sort of look at each other like, who's going to tell her? And then one person would finally say, well, Susan, you know, we tried this back in 1975, <laughs> and it didn't work. Okay, so we're not going to do that again. Like, before you were born, I was like, come on. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that's got long memory. So once you send them off and doing something that's worthless and has no point, they will not forget. Okay, so you've got to be careful about that. Intention without exertion looks like this. It is not a, I haven't seen one in a couple of years, but in 2015, I still had some schools that were pointing to their plan from 1995, saying, look, we have a real good plan. And I'm saying, well, let's see what you've done with it. And they said, we haven't gotten to that yet. But we've got a really good plan because the feedback we got said this is a really good plan. So they got a really good plan, okay, but if you're not doing it, it's worthless. It's on your shelf collecting dust with all the other really good plans that never went anywhere. What you need is this, exertion and intention. Pick a few things that are important to you, measure the heck out of those. Okay, you can always add more, but if you can write an elegant plan that you simply can't operationalize, that's nothing. Okay, and if, you don't, if you're measuring stuff you don't care about just for the sake of measuring stuff, that's not going to do any good either. So focus your time, focus your energy, pick the few things that are most important to you. What do you want your students to be able to do when they graduate? Measure those. Start there. Add more. We have a real advantage in terms of assessment because really good faculty do it all the time. Okay, think about this. When I visit a school in August, and I'll have the opportunity to visit several schools that are in the academy, and I do the same thing. I've told you this story before. Several of you have heard this, but it happens to be true, so it's a really good story. Um, as opposed to those stories you make up that aren't true. This is a good one. Um, not that I would ever do that, but here's the thing. So, it's August. It's like the first day back. And someone had this great idea that they're going to have someone come in and talk to them about assessment. Because that's what every faculty really wants to hear about the very first day back. Okay, so I play along and I go and I do the speech, you know, assessment. Uh, and I start the question with this. So I've got an auditorium, there's maybe 200 faculty there, maybe 300. And I ask them, how many of them are teaching a the class they've taught before? Okay, 
virtually everyone raises their hand. Okay, and then I ask them, how many of you are going to teach that class the exact same way you taught it last time you taught the class? And nobody raises their hand. And why not? Because everybody's made changes as a result of whatever happened, good or bad, the last time they taught that class. Okay, that's their assessment story. They already have it. Okay, they object to calling it assessment, but they've already got the story. And that's what we really need to capitalize on. Think about it this way. You start with an outcome. <laughs> The very first time you teach the course, you labor trying to figure out how can I make faculty, or how can I make my students learn this? What can I do okay, to create meaning? What can I do to facilitate learning? And then at the end of the day, or when they take the midterm exam, you look and you ask yourself, did they get it? Did they learn it? Okay, did they do well on the test? Were their papers good? Were their projects, their PowerPoint presentations, whatever? Okay, and we compare that against standards, targets, benchmarks, past performance, our goals. And we ask yourself, was that, was that good enough? Okay, because if it wasn't, then the next time you teach the course, okay, you make some changes. And then the third time you teach the course. And it's not until you taught a course maybe three or four times that you actually feel like you kind of know what's working and what's not working and how I can adjust accordingly. For many faculty, this happens during the exact same day. If you teach the course more than once during the day, okay, you come back the first day, it's like, oh, that was bad. Uh, and then you figure out how you're going to make it better. And so by 1 o'clock, you kind of roll it. By 5 o'clock, man, you know what you're doing. Okay? Because you keep going back and you change it because something works or something doesn't. And now what's happening in class was I would teach the 9 o'clock class and someone would say, oh, I just saw this on Facebook and they'll pull something up. Or they saw something on YouTube. And so it's a, it's a relevant clip, so I throw it into the class for 1 o'clock. Okay, and so we crowdsource the class so that by the time we get to the 5 o'clock class, man, okay, this has been a thoroughly vetted lesson today. <laughs> but that's assessment. That's what we do all the time and because it's second nature to faculty. Okay? They don't even think about it in terms of this is what counts. This is assessment. Another way to get faculty to think about assessment is just to ask them what has changed in your program over the last five years or over the last ten years. And why did you make those changes? Chances are there was something okay, that they recognized that wasn't working or could be better, and they made changes. Okay, now, is there always hard and fast data? Not always. But if you walk back, you may find that there's more data there than you were thinking about. Next, assessment that connects to existing classroom practices. So think about it. Okay, we evaluate students all the time in our classes. Okay, we use quizzes, tests, rubrics. It's only a little step to move from evaluating students to something that can count for assessment. Okay, so think of it this way. I give a quiz, that's evaluation. It points towards their final grade, 10 points every Friday on the quiz. Okay, and there's 100 points over the course of the semester. Okay, that adds up. Okay, that's evaluation. But quizzes can also be used as sort of an early warning sign, whether or not they're smiling and nodding whenever you say, do you all understand? Do you have any questions? OK, because they don't want to get out of there and go on to whatever is next. So they're, they're really agreeable in terms of learning. And it's not until you know, the midterm exam is a lousy time to figure out they've been faking out the whole semester. <laughs> so thinking about it in terms of we can use the quiz, OK, maybe to give them points. Uh, but also to see whether or not they understand, whether or not it's safe to move forward Monday morning when you see them again, or whether or not we got to go back and clean this up, because clearly they aren't understanding it. And if they don't understand it now, what are the odds three weeks from now they're going to figure it out by then? So thinking about it in terms of qu a quiz can be points, evaluation, but can also help us help students learn. Same thing with a test. I can score a test and return it. That's evaluation. But I can also use that test Okay, and see how students are learning. See where I did, you know, where I need to do better by looking up questions on which the students did not do well. And I don't even have to look at all of them. Okay, so I take the top third of the class, the top 20% of the class, and I look to see because those students obviously studied. If they all missed the same questions, then clearly I did not do a very good job of helping them learn it. So if they all got it wrong, okay, some if the question was badly worded. Okay, I didn't know what I was really looking for when I wrote the question. Uh, so it, it just, there was a miss there. So that gives me a good opportunity to think of what we need to go back and fix. 
okay, before we can move forward. Finally, in terms of rubrics, you know, as a speech teacher, okay, so I can fill out the rubrics, students are doing the speech, I can give it back to them, okay, with their marks on it, and maybe put a grade on there and some comments, that's evaluation. But while I'm doing that individual scoring, I can also keep a master tally sheet and use it for assessment. So that I see that 14% you know, of my stu students are still developing in terms of their verbal skills. 26% had some weird things going on non-verbally while they were standing up there. 14% okay, had some organizations. But this gives me a clear sense of before we go on to the next speech, what do we need to emphasize for the next speech? Okay, clearly, they're decent enough in terms of organization, evidence, transitions, Okay, but nonverbal delivery, 70%, like 26% of the class, okay? This is what we're going to focus on next time, is nonverbal presence. And what are you doing while you're standing up there? Okay, so this gives me a sense of what to do next. So it points directions, it identifies priorities. Okay, so again, evaluation, giving them the rubric, assessment, aggregating it, and looking to see what we learned from that. Best practice and assessment starts with a question. Okay, the question is, what are you really trying to figure out here? Just like the and, the uh, or for, the of, and the as. Assessment questions are, are important because they determine the population, who's the best person to assess? Okay, what's the population you want to look at? When's the best time to assess it? And how are we going to do it? Okay, because these are all dependent upon the question that you're asking. And different questions yield different kinds of approaches. So for instance, if you've got learning questions, have our students learned this? Okay, when would, who would you want to ask this of? Do you want to assess students' writing in freshman comp, or do you want to assess it four semesters later <laughs> when they're about to leave, or as a, you know, in a, in a four-year school towards the end of their program? Okay, what do we want to know? If the question is, have our students learned this, at this institution, we probably want to assess it towards the end okay, of their education, uh, as opposed to assessing it the first or second semester, which may not tell us anything about what they've learned. Uh, ask ourselves, how much did students learn? This, would, uh, this gets into that kind of pre-post assessment, which can sometimes work. Most of the time, my experience is it's not really worth the effort of trying to match those records over a period of time, given how the sample drops out between the first and the fourth semester, the trans students are in and out and things like that. But that might be interesting to take a look at, but that's a different kind of assessment procedure. When, we, when should we be concerned about student learning? Okay, when in the program, okay, do students start to struggle? Okay, so we've got to think about when that point is, they're moving through, moving through, and then they get to microbiology, or then they get to this particular class and things start to change. So thinking about what are those critical moments in the curriculum, those transition moments where a student is either moving forward with full steam or they start to struggle uh, mightily. Do students know they have learned? Okay, are students sort of aware of the, the progress they're making or do they understand that? And can students apply their learning? It's one thing to be able to spit it back on an exam. It's another thing entirely to be able to take it outside uh, of the context in which it was taught for them to see it. I remember I used to talk, teach my students about rhetoric and how rhetoric didn't have to be speech. Rhetoric could be uh, a movement or uh, we were using the Vietnam War Memorial or the age, AIDS quilt and how did, that res how did that response to an exigence in the situation, was that a suitable rhetorical response? Uh, and they started to see that it didn't have to be just a spoken response, but it could be a symbolic response. So thinking about when they actually start to understand how, it, how learning moves outside of the context, that's really exciting. So are students able to do that? Are you able to give them a new situation to respond to when they're able to use the theory that they understand? But you could also have questions about effectiveness. Now these are not necessarily student learning questions, but they facilitate student learning. For instance, uh, are there enough courses for students to take to move through the curriculum? Or do we create some funnels by having three sections of a course, one term that filter into two sections the second term, and so some students can't get into the class because there's just not enough seats. Thinking about it in terms of are we coordinating with the curriculum, we'll spend a lot of time talking about that in a few minutes. Okay, thinking about the accuracy in terms of our, our students, are we measuring the right things, are our outcomes appropriate for that particular field? 
availability of classes. Do we have some classes that run on weird schedules, like every third or fourth semester or something like that, that again may slow a student's progression down? So questions about effectiveness. And questions for the students relative to their level of satisfaction, their observations of what they encountered at that institution, uh, and behavioral. How did they study? How did they enact the college experience? How did they engage okay, with their peers, with their faculty people? Okay, how did they do college? And especially when uh, Mason, when you've got a, a, you know, a virgin population of Hispanic students, understanding how those students are doing college and what's working for them and not is something that's really important to understand relative to how we're going to be able to facilitate students' learning. Okay, so lots of questions, but you have to understand what you're asking to be able to understand how to go about finding that answer. Relatedly, and obviously then, best practice starts with understanding exactly what you want students to know and do. Uh, you can get pretty good at this because it becomes very clear right off the bat that if a program doesn't have particularly good student learning outcomes, there's really nowhere to go with that. Uh, at one point, a friend of mine had missed a meeting or something and wound up being an assessment person at her school. This was back in, <laughs> <laughs> Just back in like 2002, 2003, and she called me panicked and said, you know, all of a sudden I'm the assessment director and I don't know anything about this, uh, but they left me like 25 different programs to look at. Um, and I don't know what to do with these, so can I send them to you? Would you look at them and let, let's talk about these? Yeah, sure. So this big box shows up, uh, and my husband is looking at me saying, you volunteered to do this, huh? And I thought, you know, but you could go through it pretty fast, because if the outcomes were lousy, okay, nothing else in that assessment report was going to make any sense at all. If they did not know what they were assessing to start with, okay, all the data in the world is not going to dig them out of that hole. So it starts with good outcomes. Good assessment starts with good outcomes. Bad outcomes, worthless assessment. It's a real simple formula. If there's just if, if you can't figure out what they're assessing, when you read it, they don't probably know either. So think about this. Okay, the outcome should be student-centered, <coughs> learner-centered, what the student is going to be able to do. Okay? Not what the faculty are going to do, not what the curriculum is going to do, not what the institution is going to be able to do to support student learning. It's all about what the students can know and do. Secondly, they're specific, and I'll talk about that in a second. And they're measurable. Okay? The cleaner the outcome, the easier it is to assess. Okay? So I'm liking something that looks like this. Students will be able to action verb something. You will notice it is not. Students will be able to action verb comma, action verb comma, action verb comma, something, something, and something else under this, that, and some third circumstance. Okay? When you start throwing that stuff together, okay, you are doomed. <coughs> Okay, because there is no way you're going to fight your way out of that. So here's one. Students will contribute to their community by applying academic information to cultural diversity in order to engage in problem solving and appreciation efforts. Doesn't that just make your eyes bleed when you look at that? <laughs> you can actually see what happened here, okay? I would be willing to bet real good money, in fact, uh, that what happened here was they were writing gen ed outcomes, and they decided that they only wanted to have like five or six. So they got to number six, and they still hadn't dealt with like diversity, community, information literacy, and all that, so they threw them into one big outcome. You know, I'm guessing that's exactly what happened there, because that's the only rationale for an outcome that looks like this. Okay, they can show you all kinds of data, and you will not know what they're talking about. Okay, so this is a problem. This is more likely what it looks like. Students will recognize, analyze, and interpret, nothing like three action verbs, human experience, whatever that is, in terms of personal, intellectual, and social contexts. Okay, you're doomed right there on the and. As if the commas aren't gonna kill you, the and is gonna kill you. Okay, at least it could be personal, intellectual, or social contexts. Okay, that means they can do one of the three. But when you've got an and in there, that means you're responsible for that whole pile of stuff. So think about this in terms of what are you really doing here? When you have multiple action verbs, you can clean these things up really quickly by going for the highest order action verb. So if we want to recognize, analyze, and interpret, let's just go to interpret. Because from their interpretation, we'll know if they recognized it and what they, uh, how they analyzed it uh, in their interpretation. So, Thinking about this in terms of the outcomes that we're starting with, this is particularly problematic uh, in general education, okay, where one of two things happened. 
okay? The Jenna outcomes were written by a committee, uh, or worse, uh, the outcomes were written by the state, who has no under real understanding about writing outcomes or what they're really doing. And so you get some outcomes that are, and I'll show you a few in a minute, that are just like, whoa, what are they, what, what, what are they thinking we're going to do with this? Sounds really good and academic with all those commas and ands, but it's really nothing that we can work with. So thinking about the format, students will be able to action verb something. The particular thing you need to pay attention here is that action verb. Again, you only get one. Make it count. <laughs> but it has to be the right one. So you really have to think about this in terms of if you're looking at a program or if you're looking at a course. And what level is that course? So for instance, you've got the Bloom's Taxonomy, the Food Chain of Higher Order Thinking Skills. Now, those of you who have seen the slide before may want to grab the hand of the person next to you who have not seen it because it's kind of ugly. Um, <laughs> and as a speech teacher, I should know this is an ugly slide. This is a certifiably bad slide in terms of the number of stuff going on here. But it's cool in that it gives you a sense of what those different potential action verbs might be at the different levels of old Bloom's Taxonomy. Okay, Knowledge Comprehension, Application Synthesis, uh, application analysis, synthesis, and evaluation, okay? So when we're looking at it in terms of lower level course outcomes, okay, are probably going to be knowledge, knowledge comprehension application, maybe moving into analysis. Upper division course outcomes or program outcomes should be at least application analysis, synthesis, or evaluation. So a program level outcome that says students will have a basic understanding of this is really not a program level outcome. That's a course outcome from a 100 level course. So thinking about it in terms of your program outcomes really are higher order thinking skills. These are what we want students to be able to do when they graduate. Okay, so what do we want them to be able to do? It's beyond just knowledge and comprehension. Okay, so thinking about this very carefully in the level of the degree and what makes sense. Student learning outcomes should be public. In terms of they should be in the catalog or online, they should be posted in programs, uh, program offices. Students should know what they are, they should be on the syllabus. Because the program outcomes provide, especially program outcomes, uh, and to a degree genetic outcomes, provide a map for the students to start thinking about what they're learning. Okay, why do I have to take this? Well, because they're going to learn that. <laughs> That's why you have to take this. So they start to see how it fits together. So they should be public, they should be distinctive. Uh, if you've got three programs that all have the exact same learning outcomes that isn't foreign language, okay, then chances are, because in foreign language or international languages, the outcomes are usually the same. Writing, speaking, listening, uh, culture, and, uh, okay, speaking, listening, something else. Okay, reading. Uh, so you get the basic idea. So unless it's a foreign language program or international languages program, most of your outcomes are going to be different. This is not to say that you can't have a core of similar outcomes like in a college of business. Okay, there's core, and then you get two or three extra outcomes for finance or MIS or accounting. Okay? Finally, and this is the most, this I think was most surprising to people, but also one of the coolest, and that is that your student learning outcomes provide, provide a, a perceptual framework, not just for the faculty, but interestingly enough, also for the students. Think about it in terms of their outcomes plus outcome plus outcome. Okay, plus outcome, you gotta graduate. Before we started talking about student learning outcomes, the students would write their cover letters, okay, to a potential employer and say, well, I took two classes in this and three classes in this, and I had one class in this, uh, and maybe I studied abroad. Okay, da, 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 da. okay. Once we start talking about student learning outcomes and the student learning outcomes become obvious to the students because we're talking about it all the time, what can I write about then? They can write about their teamwork skills, because I worked in team projects that did this, this, and this. They can write about their critical thinking skills and how they had to solve these problems, okay, in these particular situations, maybe during their study abroad. Uh, so we, it really helps them think about their learning in a different way and transfer all of those classes that they had to take into what they actually learned, which is far more appealing when you're sending that letter out, and it's also much more fun to write that letter, to really reflect back on what I learned, what I can do as a result of studying this particular program, studying gen ed at this particular institution. So it really does help frame their thinking. Best practice and assessment, I've been alluding to this for a few minutes now. 
distinguishes between course and program outcomes. Course outcomes identify what students are going to learn in that particular course. Okay? They may connect the course to Gen Ed. So for instance, uh, if, a if you have a distribution, uh, distribution plan for Gen Ed, so we'll say two courses here, three courses here, two classes here, two over here, okay, from each of these categories, okay, some of those outcomes may be related to the Gen Ed category outcomes. The course outcomes are shared across all faculty who teach the course, which means in my department, when I was department chair in common studies, we got 88 different sections of public speaking. We run about 9,500 FTE. So we got in 40, 44 sections of public speaking taught in the fall, 44 sections taught in the spring. Okay? They all have to be the same course, which means there are certain things that have to happen in this course, and those certain things, okay, we've got some parameters relative to uh, you know, the number of speeches students have to do, but also in terms of the student learning outcomes. At the end of the course, however you get there, students need to be able to do these things. So we have to share those outcomes across, including face-to-face -face faculty, online faculty, full-time faculty, part-time faculty. That's what the course is, this set of outcomes. How you get there, that's up to you. But you have to achieve these particular student learning outcomes. Course outcomes are assessed throughout the course. Okay, we give assignments, we give tests, we give grades, projects. Assignments and exams that assess achievements of the course outcomes, as we said. Program outcomes, on the other hand, identify what students will learn as a result of the multiple courses. So this is what it all adds up to. Think about it, okay? If you're in a vocational or technical program, professional program, if you wanted to sell your graduates to a potential employer, what are the five things you would tell them that your students can do? Okay, you're not going to say, well, they did courses in this, courses in this. You know, what are those five things? Okay, chances are that's what's really important to you, and that would be a great place to start thinking about your program outcomes. Okay, what can my students do? Start there. Program outcomes should be shared with students for the reason I just talked about in terms of helping them frame their understanding of the curriculum. They should be reinforced throughout the curriculum. We'll talk about that in a second. And they need to be defined. Your program outcomes can't stand alone. And this is what I see a lot, that we come up with a program outcome often in Gen Ed that says students will be able to think critically. Good luck. Because uh, we have no idea what that means. And everybody in the room has a different understanding of what thinking critically means. So we have to go a little bit beyond just defining the outcome to asking ourselves and agreeing on what it's going to look like when we actually see this. These are called performance indicators. They provide a language for talking about learning. Okay, they're shared across faculty. We all have the same idea of what we're talking about. They help structure our assessment because we're assessing the performance indicators. And they're outcome specific, not assignment specific. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. So hold that thought, okay? Outcome specific, not assignment specific. So think about it this way. Let's say your outcome. Okay, or your, your goal category for Gen Ed is communication. Most of you have a goal category for communication. And you may have student learning outcomes related to students being able to write, students being able to relate to other people in a personal outcome maybe, maybe a public speaking outcome, maybe a listening outcome, maybe a teamwork or participation on a task solving group or something. So you may have different outcomes. You probably won't have five for communication. Okay, so you could have uh, one or two. Generally, okay, the communication outcome is tied to writing and speaking. Often in the same outcome, which is a bad idea. <laughs> Students will be able to write and speak effectively. That's really two outcomes because it's possible to do one and not the other really good. So thinking about that. So for each of these, we've got to ask ourselves, how will we know it when we see it? So what counts in terms of, for instance, good writing? What counts in terms of interpersonal relationships? What counts in terms of oral communication and public speaking, in terms of listening? We have to agree on that. So if you were going to grade a student's paper, what would you look for in their writing? I'm sorry? Organization? Thesis? Structure? Grammar? Spelling? Maybe source citation? 
uh, maybe um, appropriate style for the intended audience, whoever that person is going to be. So think about it. We have to agree on what those indicators are. Because if we're all grading writing differently, that doesn't, the students are more confused now than when they were than when they started. Because it counts here, but it doesn't count over there. Uh, I, had, I had a student, actually, who took that very compartmentalized approach uh, and complained that he got a very bad grade on a term paper in my interpersonal communication class because I am not allowed to grade on mechanics because this is not a writing class. He's like, no, I checked. This is a speech class. This is not an English class. And I thought, something sort of crossed the bounds of different departments. But, you know, is that kind of real compartmentalized? It doesn't count here and it counts over there. So thinking about what are going to be these key performance indicators, and we've got to agree on those. There is no magic number. I'm a pragmatist. The number is the number you can agree on. If you agree on two, you've got two. If you've got five, you've got five. Okay, but you have to agree. You can always start small and add more as you start practicing. But starting with the two things that we agree on that we're all going to assess, grammar and spelling, okay, organization and thesis. Okay, we have to agree we're going to start on something that no matter what kind of writing you're doing, this is what we're looking for. Let's take a look at how this works. Okay, so for instance, for uh, we have public, public speaking outcome, we agree on the indicators, okay, and these, we're going to use these indicators to evaluate the student learning demonstration, whatever it is in whatever class it happens to be in, okay? So let's say we're looking at delivery content and organization, and the students are obviously going to do a speech, but they could be doing a speech in a bunch of different departments. They could be do, doing a bunch of different kinds of speeches. Okay, but delivery content and organization, because the indicators are outcome specific, not assignment specific, remember so we come in, that's it. So the, the performance indicators are related to the outcome, which means that faculty have the freedom to be doing all kinds of different speeches in different areas. So maybe healthcare, they're doing a demonstration on a particular procedure. Okay, maybe over in marketing, they're doing a sales presentation. That's great. Okay, maybe in history, they're doing an oral report on something. Okay, delivery, content, organization, that works. Okay, maybe they're doing a briefing, okay, in some other field where they're briefing on a particular assignment or briefing on a particular process, okay? So again, delivery, content, and organization. This doesn't mean that faculty can add other things if they want, but it means that delivery, content, and organization, or what we agreed on, are non-negotiable performance indicators for that particular outcome. So when I went back to teaching in 2009, because I saw my career moving towards an end, I retired. I retired 2015. So 2009, I knew my date was October or was uh, June of 2015. So I went back to teaching. I went back to teach public speaking. I went back to teach four sections of public speaking every semester, because I realized at that point, having been an assessment, that it was a bad idea to put our youngest, most inexperienced faculty in with our neediest population of students. Our first, year, our first semester students. So I went back to teach freshmen. Okay, now let me tell you, teaching four sections of public speaking is sort of a profiles and courage kind of academic assignment. <laughs> uh, I loved it, but do I want to hear 100 demonstration speeches a week? I don't think so. Uh, so they would be doing different assignments in different classes because it just it didn't really matter what the assignment was. I'm looking at delivery content and organization. Or what you know, I'm looking for evidence and support. So we could change it up and loop it around. I don't think any faculty, we have 20 different faculty teaching, I don't think anyone was doing the same assignments as some other faculty person. We'd switch assignments all the time if someone had a really good idea. But it didn't have to be lockstep, everybody do exactly the same thing, as long as we're assessing the same thing. So for instance, my nine o'clock class would be doing movie reviews. So my one o'clock class is uh, showing me app, uh, explaining apps on phones or something, you know, their favorite app. Uh, and the afternoon class was doing, what were they doing? I, oh, I can't remember, oh, um, I can't remember. They're doing something along that same time as in the analyzing something, which totally blew. Uh, I can't remember at the moment. But, so it's different things, to, and it all works. Same thing in terms of writing, if we're looking at mechanics and structure, voice, coherence, and purpose for the writing. They could be writing a letter in some field. They could be writing a summary in some other field. They could be doing case notes. They could be doing a work order. As long as mechanics, structure, voice, coherence, and um, purpose all make sense for that particular field, we can still look at a bunch of different kinds of writing. I just I got an email from a school it was in the academy, and they were having trouble with their they're an art school. They're having trouble with their developmental ed. Okay, and because students are just saying, you know, how you. 
writing five paragraph essays. So they paired developmental ed. This is an art school with drawing one, and the students wrote about art. Okay, it's like, whoa, what a concept. All of a sudden, they're writing about something that means something to them. We can still do all of these things and get them to write, but they're happier about it. And they're, they're, they completed the class. It was the highest percentage passing rate in any of the developmental ed sections. It's like, how cool is that? Just by rethinking in terms of, we can have all kinds of assignments here. They could be writing a proposal. You get the basic idea, okay? You have to have an outcome, but you have to understand what that means, and you have to share that, even if it's only a couple of ideas that we all think are going to count. And here's why you need to do that. Let's go back to the public speaking example again. I got 44 faculty, uh, or 44 sections, probably 18 different faculty teaching the course. If my first faculty person is evaluating their students on volume, poise, and their conclusion, that's cool. But if my second faculty is looking at gestures, rate, and evidence, okay, and my third faculty is grading on sources, examples, and organization, and my next faculty person is grading their speeches on eye contact, style, and appearance, whether or not they dressed up on speech day. And my next faculty person is teaching uh, is grading on transitions, verbal variety, and attention getters. You can imagine the fun we're going to have with that conversation at the end of the semester. Can our students deliver an effective public speech? Depends on who you ask. Because I got someone saying, hey, yeah, they had great eye contact. Okay, they seemed pretty comfortable up there. And I love it when they dress up on speech day. <laughs> and I'm thinking it's 30 below zero. I don't care what they're wearing outside. Um, I'm looking at sources. Did they cite their sources? I'm looking for examples to support their point. And I'm looking for a reasonable organizational structure based on their analysis of the audience. Okay? So you have two different real perspectives. If we all collected all this data at this point, we just wasted a lot of people's time because we can't de derive anything from this because everyone was looking at different stuff. So again, we need to agree on the outcomes and the indicators. Not a huge laundry list of them. A few indicators would be fine. Okay, just that we have a, a, a coherent definition across multiple faculty. Okay, you ready for a quiz? Okay, let's do it. Uh, these are the outcomes from a cold Midwestern state that I'm familiar with. Um, these are the, the outcomes that were written for it was the transfer curriculum for this state. So here's the first outcome. Students will be able to gather factual information and apply it to a problem in a manner that is relevant, clear, comprehensive, and conscious of possible bias in the information selected. Doesn't that make you want to just assess like crazy? <laughs> Whoa, can't wait to get my hands on that thing. What are we going to do with this? How can we clean this up? What's it really asking us to do here? Get rid of and put in more. Maybe something along the lines that students will be able to apply factual information to a problem, or somehow we have to tease this out. Because what they did here is a very common mistake in terms of outcomes, and that is they put the components or the performance criteria into the outcome. And those would be relevance, clarity, comprehensiveness, awareness, and bias. They worked all of those in to the outcome. Okay, it's really a simple outcome to assess, or a lot easier to assess if you understand the structure of the outcome and the problem with that one. Okay? So we have to, if you get outcomes like that, you might be able to tease them down to make them more manageable. Here's another one. Students will be able to imagine, think about that for a minute, <laughs> imagine and seek out a variety of possible goals, assumptions, interpretations, or perspectives which can give alternative meanings or solutions to given situations or problems. I always use this example of one that just sort of screams, hey, look at me, I was written by a committee. Uh, because we're trying so hard to cover all of the waterfront there, whew, uh, when we're really just asking if students will be able to provide alternative solutions to a situation or a problem. Okay, can they look at more than one way to go about doing this? In this case, your performance indicators might be things like the variety of assumptions, uh, or uh, perspectives or interpretations that they're able to come up with, or the analysis of a comparative advantage. Why is one alternative or solution better than another? Okay, so this one doesn't have the same problem as the first one, where you built the performance indicators into the outcome. This is just trying to cover every sort of waterfront there is in liberal arts, I think. Okay, here's this one now. You can see just by the structure of it that this is not going to go well. 
Okay, students will formulate and test hypotheses by performing laboratory simulation or field experiments and, and, and to test at least two of the natural science disciplines. One of these experimental components should develop in greater depth students' laboratory experience and collection of data, statistical graphical analysis, appreciation of its sources of error and uncertainty. Can we just sort of boil that down to something like students will be able to test hypotheses? <laughs> you know, and what we did here is the same thing you noticed in the first one, where uh, data collection, statistical analysis, graphical analysis, identification of sources of error, they're built into the outcome, which again, it's a small thing, but it makes the outcome, first of all, when you first see it, it's so daunting that people just don't want to go there. And it would be so much easier to ask faculty to test, to uh, assess whether or not the faculty can test a hypothesis, and these are the things we're looking for, than to give them this whole paragraph and expect them to wade their way through it. Okay, so structured presentation is big. You passed the quiz, congratulations. Next, creates and understands a curriculum map. I'm huge on curriculum map. Okay, I can mostly tell if an institution knows what they're doing in terms of assessing especially program outcomes if they can show me a curriculum map, which means they've really thought through what these courses they're making their students take are designed to do relative to the program level student learning outcomes. So think about it this way. You got your program level student learning outcomes, you got the curriculum number of courses that students are taking, let's just say there's 10, okay? So we can indicate which courses support which program level student learning outcomes in a perfect world. Okay, and I was in a, I, I taught for three or four years, I never got to do this. You, know, you would start with the outcomes when you build the curriculum. So here, let's start with student learning outcomes, decide what we want our students to know at the end, and then let's build the curriculum that's going to get us there. That never happens. Okay, if you're lucky, you were able to do that. Most of the time, okay, we had a curriculum in place and someone said you need to program level student learning outcomes, so we retrofitted them, okay, and tried to cram them all together, okay. So in a perfect world, you build the curriculum this way. The reality is you're going to have your curriculum in place and you've got your program level student learning outcomes, and you're gonna ask your faculty which courses support which outcome, and this is what they're going to tell you, <laughs> because every course is the most important course in the curriculum, okay, so we say this. Uh, one way to tease this out and to get it down to uh, where it makes sense is to ask faculty to indicate in which courses students actually receive feedback okay, on their performance relative to the program level student learning outcome. Okay, it's not just enough to say, oh, it's a critical thinking course. Like, is there an assignment or a project or a test that shows us whether or not they're learning critical thinking? Because if there isn't, it doesn't count. So then you're going to get a map maybe that looks like this, okay? There's a bunch of different ways to curriculum map. Uh, some use like introduce, emphasize, and reinforce. Introduce, emphasize, and mastery. A whole bunch of different ways. I like to go back to Bloom's taxonomy in terms of knowledge comprehension, application analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Because I think that, level, that gives us a more nuanced understanding of what's happening okay, in the curriculum. Okay, so in one case, you know, some outcomes, like number one, we're introducing something, knowledge comprehension in that first course, and then there's some application analysis, okay, in the middle part of the curriculum, and then in the end, okay, they're synthesizing and evaluating. Okay, so you can see this. When you start to look at this, you understand the role of a curriculum map in analyzing the curriculum. Because when you start to look at this, you start to recognize there are some issues here. Okay? What are you noticing? <laughs> Okay, so some courses have nothing like uh, number four. Well, let's start with number seven. Uh, we've got sort of this empty requirement. Students have to take this course, but there's no really discernible reason why. What's happening in there? I guess someone really likes teaching that course, maybe. Uh, but why is that there? Uh, so we've got to ask ourselves, do we need this course? Is this really a required course? Uh, or are we mismapping the course somehow? Maybe this course is really doing some things. Okay, but we just haven't mapped it. So we've got an issue there. Okay, some of you noticed we got this on number four, too, an orphan outcome. Everybody thinks it's important, but not in my course. I'm looking at you writing. Okay, everyone wants the students to be able to write, uh, but writing only counts if students receive feedback on their writing, if writing counts. So even though students may be doing a lot of writing, unless they're receiving feedback on the writing, okay, it doesn't get mapped. So what's happening here is we assume that they learned how to write in comp one and comp two, 
uh, and now they're sort of on their own. Because if I can understand it, okay, I'm not a writing teacher. As you know, they tell me, so we've got a problem here, and that we're just sort of taking it's like whatever they can write, whatever. Uh, and we're not paying attention to it. So this is an orphan outcome. A few other issues here. You may have noticed this one, sort of a stagnant outcome. We keep going over the same thing over and over and over and over at this very basic level. Problem here is that if these are good program level student learning outcomes, they're not written at the knowledge level. Okay, they're written at a much higher level, but the students aren't going to get there if we just keep talking about the same stuff at the same low, low, low level over and over again. Got this one, we hit it hard right out of the blocks and then we just sort of abandoned it. Okay, chances are without frequent repetition and reinforcement, they're not going to be able to re reproduce that level uh, of um, ability in uh, class number four. So this is an evaluation when they graduate a year, two years, three years later. Got this one where we're sort of inside out. We're asking students to synthesize and evaluate before they really know the foundations of what it is they're supposed to do. As a young faculty person at Winona State, uh, I made that mistake once, just once. Uh, and what happened was, you know, I thought it would be good that the students critiqued each other's speeches. <laughs> and so they critiqued each other's speeches, and they also they were all so good. Uh, and then they got a B minus for me, and they're saying, but everyone in the class loved my speech. And I'm saying, but what did they know? <laughs> I haven't taught them anything yet. So it's like, how are they, why am I asking them to critique this? This is such a bad idea. Uh, so we never did that again. Uh, because they didn't have the tools to be able to do it. Okay, by the end of the semester, they got a little bit better. But asking them to do something like that before they have the foundational knowledge is really folly. I got this one. This is sort of the empty requirement, uh, where this is usually, uh, and this is again, it's true. So I teach them freshman speech, course number one, and then they don't do anything until their senior presentations. And then I get the phone call saying, so Susan, I don't know what's happening in freshman speech, but it's clearly not working. Because their senior seminar sem 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 presentations were awful. And I'm thinking, you know, I had them for 15 weeks, five years ago. Okay, well, you guys, if it's that important to you, you got to be working with it in the meantime, because quite honestly, their movie reviews and website reviews and sales speeches and whatever we were demonstration speeches really did not prepare them to do a professional presentation in your particular field. Okay, that's your job. My job is to make sure they can do sort of basics of presenting and organizing a speech, but you have to contextualize it in terms of what's happening in your particular field. So abandoning it for the whole like three years in the meantime or two semesters or three semesters in the meantime, bad idea. A couple other things, we have this situation here, okay, where we're assuming that it, it, one would think that their last class would bring together more of the information, not just a few things would bubble up into their last experience. We've got the option cluster here in some curricula where students can choose one of several courses and yet all these courses are not created equal. Which one do you think students are going to take? It's the easy course, the first one. That's like marking time. That's stuff they've already done before. Okay, whereas you look at that course number eight and that's actually a much better capstone course than whatever's happening in number 10. Okay, I mean that course is really pushing those students. So at this point now, we've created an unlevel playing field for the students who happen to wander into course number eight, uh, as opposed to the students who wound up in course number six, which is just largely a review. So think about that in terms of when you have an option cluster, choose one of these three courses. How are those courses functioning in the curriculum relative to the outcomes? So the rule might be that whatever this course is, it has to be a writing course, it has to be an analysis course, it has to be something, okay? Regardless of the context, or the content in that course. That's the next thing we're going to get to, yes. Well, maybe not exactly the next thing, but close. Uh, the curriculum map can also help us when we're thinking about revising our curriculum. Let's say we realize we need to add a new course, so we think about where that course is going to go, and we make room for it, and we put that new course NC in there. When we look at the curriculum map, what do we recognize about that new course? really exactly the same as the very first course they took. In terms of the outcomes, it might be a new context on it, but we've got to ask ourselves, is this really a course that we need at this point? Should this be a different course? Okay, in terms of the curriculum, when are they going to take it, and what should they be doing at that point in the curriculum? Next thing to think about is how we use uh, the curriculum app to understand learning. Let's say, for instance, we assess a particular outcome uh, towards the end of the student's program and realize it didn't go very well. 
Okay, then we've got to start asking ourselves, how did they get this far with us not knowing it? Okay, where were the signs okay, that this was going to be problematic? This is a really important one relative to writing. Faculty complain all the time that their students and their senior projects can't write. And it's like, well, how did you not notice? Okay, where were they doing other writing in the curriculum that you should have been able to flag that student and say, you know, you need some more work here. You need to go to the writing center. You need to do something. But this is not working for you, okay? So thinking about it in terms of where we can go back and start thinking about identifying those critical courses when a student has to hit a certain mark at a certain place in order to move through the curriculum. The odds of them getting better in terms of writing on their own, okay, is probably not going to be very good. Next, we have to think about how they take the curriculum. We assume students take the curriculum like this. In some curricula, they actually have to take it step by step by step. That's great, because then you can sort of predict. But oftentimes, students take curricula, especially in gen ed, and to, based on whatever is available and whatever is at a preferable time. Okay, so they take one, you know, these, these their first semester, they take these to their second semester, their third semester, okay, and their last semester in a two-year curriculum. Uh, so this is what we assume, and we don't know that's the case. And so what happens now is, what if this is the course, these are the courses uh, that a student finds themselves in, itself in, in Gen Ed as a first semester freshman? I don't think that's going to work out real well. Because <laughs> these courses are moving, they're, they're assuming certain knowledge that their students don't have. So in many cases, just by the luck of the draw in terms of what a student registers and what classes they get, they're already in trouble, okay? Because they don't have the foundational knowledge. So we really have to understand those gen ed courses. We really have to understand the curriculum sequence and when students get off sequence, what's the impact of that? Nothing is more uh, difficult as when you have a student who got into your class, okay, because there wasn't anything else available and they just, they're floundering the whole time. It's as uncomfortable as having a senior in public speaking, which they put off until the very end. Okay, because there is, is, it's just it's a different group of students and it creates an interesting dynamic in the classroom. Best practice and assessment engages in strategic data collection. So think about this in terms of, remember the population, the timing, and the method? Okay, and the questions that we came up with. If we're looking at, okay, did our students learn this? We're going to look at experiences towards the end of the curriculum. Okay, this is the data that we report. Yes, students learned it. Okay, from these classes, we have these outcomes. This is what we can tell you. Okay? If you're looking at in terms of value added, there may be some that we're going to look at pre-post. Here's where they were when they started. Here's where they are now. Okay, so we can show some development there. If we're looking at critical learning points, we may identify, okay, at what point, okay, are students applying the knowledge they're either getting it or they're not. Okay, so we're thinking very strategically about in which classes we're going to collect assessment data. Okay, it's not every single class, it's not every single faculty, it's not every single student, it's not every single semester. We're thinking who's got the answer to this question. If we're measuring a student learning outcome, we want to measure it towards the end of the student's time here because it's an outcome. What I'm noticing in the academy, which kind of makes me crazy, is that they're collecting data everywhere and they're putting it all together. So I've got first semester and fourth semester students in the same sample. Okay, some students had one writing class, some had six writing classes or six writing experiences in different classes. Their writing is really different. When we throw it all together, we wash out the impact. This is not a particularly helpful approach. Okay, when the department chair comes in and says, well, we have to assess something, and someone says, if we ever teach us that class, like, oh, I'll assess in my course. It's like, but if that's not an assessment point course, why are we assessing that? Okay, so random acts of assessment where you just sort of randomly pick something to assess, not a good idea. If we're looking at issues of efficiency and coordination and accuracy, we can notice where there's gaps in the curriculum, like in this case, number three, where we talk about it and then we let it die for another several courses or another several semesters. Okay, that creates a problem. We can look at uh, the effectiveness of it in terms of which outcomes are students doing the best at. Okay, what's the pattern in terms of their learning there relative to the outcome. So you get the basic idea here. The other questions about experience, decide when we want to ask about satisfaction, when we want to ask about their observations, when we want to ask about how they study or how they change their studying. Okay, over the course of their time with us. A couple more. 
Assessment aligns tools with expectations. Okay? Think about that, or tools with your questions. So if we're looking at what kind of, what our students feel about something, okay, it's a subjective self-report, we're probably going to use questions or surveys, interviews. Okay? If we're wondering how do students understand their learning, okay, then we're going to ask for a reflective essay or an interview. Okay, if our question is what do students do? Okay, how do they do college? How are they interacting with the institution? We might ask for, ask for an action, a log book, or an action report. It's like when you meet with a student who says, I just can't study enough. It's like, well, let's take out your calendar and look at what you're doing. Okay, and see where we can find time for study. The question is, what do we know? Objective data. We can look at databases, records, incident reports, in terms of just the facts, ma'am. And if the question is performance analysis, what did students learn? Then we look at checklists, rubrics, scales, and exams. So I'm going to finish talking about these different kinds of tools, okay? Checklists, rubrics, scales, and exams to sort of give you a sense of what's out there and how they can be used. <coughs> this is not going to be particularly effective. I mean, what do you report? 59% of the students self-reported yes. Uh, in terms of, or faculty said yes, they've got critical thinking skills. Even if you add 10 points to the scale, it's still not going to give you much information. What do you fix if your students are at a six? You have no idea, because you have no idea what that means. So think about that. Um, Self-assessment, I kind of like this, because I really think the best answer is E, if they're good critical thinkers. <laughs> Same, yeah. I give that kid the most points for that answer, actually. Um, measuring outcomes, we can look at the number of correct, we can look at checklists, scales, rubrics, so if we've got an exam. Thinking about what are the outcomes, both course outcomes and program outcomes, okay, the indicators, and then making sure that we're asking questions that connect to the actual uh, outcomes. This is really problematic when the textbook company gives you the exams, okay, which may or may not tie to the outcomes for your particular course. Uh, so making sure that we think we're assessing something that really stands for the kind of learning we're expecting them to do. Same thing with the checklist, outcomes, indicators. Okay, you can be yes, was this present, was this here, was this there. Uh, it's not as fine uh, of an assessment tool, but it can work for certain kinds of assignments. So for my first assignment in public speaking, I'm checking to see, did they have an introduction? Did they have a conclusion? Did they have transitions? Did they cite their sources? And just sort of basic, are the different parts there from which we can build? Another way to do it is looking at a scale, maybe semantic differential from ineffective to effective especially effective if we actually identify what a one, two, three, or four means, okay? And then rubrics, which I think a bunch of you are familiar with, start with performance indicators, okay? Descriptions of student performance at various levels, maybe below expectations, and we're actually describing behaviors here. Meets expectations, exceeds expectations, unacceptable at this point, this performance level satisfactory or outstanding, this one is somewhat problematic when you do it by frequency. The students sometimes cite their sources, occasionally cite their sources, rarely cite their sources. Uh, and a lot of the value rubrics, which you might be familiar with, really do this, and that they just change one word across the whole thing, which causes them to re uh, requires a judgment call on the part of the faculty in terms of how frequently something happens. Okay, is that sometimes or is that usually? Okay, and so you have different opinions there, so it's hard to use those rubrics when the only change, okay, is looking at the frequency delineator. Instead, if you were to look at knowledge comprehension, they understand this, they comprehend this, they can apply this, or they can actually adapt it to a new audience and evaluate it, then you're on to something that's really important in terms of assessment. But beyond just using the tools, I'm going to ask you to dig into the data. Think about it in terms of data like this. Class average was 88%. 75% of the students received a B or better. 82% of the students received a yes on competency three in the oral communication observation. The average, of, the average score on the group observation form was 1.75. This is my favorite. 75% of the students achieved 85% of the oral communication competencies 90% of the time. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's, a, it's got a percent that we report it. And this is just not helpful. This doesn't tell us anything relative to whether or not our students have genuinely achieved the outcome. So 
I want to implore you uh, in terms of looking at the data and actually digging down into that data and figuring out, okay, so we've got the task questions, they're anchored on the indicators related to the outcomes, Let's look and see what percentage of students got those questions right and recognize where students are struggling on the exam. Okay, which questions didn't work. Okay, so we know on the second outcome, the first two questions, okay, or the first two outcome or uh, performance indicators really did not go well. So now we have a point for improvement. We've got a direction. In terms of a checklist, we can look at the average in terms of which students included these things. And again, we get a sense of where we can go to improve. So go to that second level, as opposed to just reporting sort of a, a one, uh, for the rubric report, you know, the average score on the rubric is 4.3, but that doesn't tell me what's, what, where they did well. Same thing here again, we can look at different averages. Rather than reducing a rubric to a particular score, where they get maybe, there's three points, so there's 12 points possible on the rubric, and they got three, 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 and three. So we report the score as a 12 or something, we report it as a six. That doesn't help us, okay? Going down into the next level, okay, to be able to see where we're, where, where we're strong and where we're weak. Then we can start to really move forward in terms of understanding our students' learning and working to improve our learning and also allowing students to understand what they need to do in order to improve their own learning and how they can move forward. My, that was a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I know a lot of you are taking pictures. We can get, I can just give you, and I can, they'll shh. We'll somehow make that available. Thank you. Uh,